Tony Tascona had many titles throughout his life, including athlete, soldier, aircraft technician, and father. But it was the title of artist that earned him national distinction. He was known for his use of industrial materials and forms, a style which transitioned throughout his career, earning him a reputation as one of Canada's most innovative artists. His work has shown in some of the most notable galleries in Canada, and he was commissioned to create art for some of Manitoba's most high-profile organizations. In the mid-1970s, Tony's growing presence and influence earned him the title of Godfather of the Manitoba art scene. In 1996, Tony's title would change again when he was appointed as a member of the Order of Canada. Much more than an acknowledgement of Tony's artistic achievements, the appointment served to honor his generous spirit. He donated thousands of dollars in artwork to local charities and created a bursary at the University of Winnipeg. But beyond his charitable spirit, Tony's greatest gift was his unique perception of the world. And some people go through life never perceiving anything. Fortunately, I have the artist that has that gift who can see where other people can't see, go where other people can't go. And that's what, that's what it amounts to. Antonio Tascona, born in 1926, was the 13th of 14 children. His parents were Sicilian immigrants who came to Canada through Ellis Island in 1902. Following the promise of fertile land and new beginnings, they settled in the town of St. Boniface, across the river from the bustling trade centre of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Tony grew up during the height of the Great Depression, and life was far from easy for the large family. His father had an enterprising mind, and he managed to support the family working long hours selling homegrown fruits and vegetables door to door. But in the early 1940s, Tony's father passed away. And shortly after, his older brothers were drafted for the Second World War. Tony was left to run the business and became the sole supporter of the family. After only a few months, the business proved too difficult for Tony to run on his own. The 16-year-old began working odd jobs, and in his spare time, he wowed the locals with his skills in both baseball and hockey. Tony's life would soon change again. On March 17, 1944, the day after his 18th birthday, Tony was drafted into the Canadian Army. However, his mother was ailing, and he was granted a leave of absence to care for her. Three months later, she passed away, and Tony reported for duty at Fort Osborne Barracks. I went in the Army, and all I did was play baseball. And got, and when I got to Camp Shadow, they, they got me playing baseball and hockey. And next thing you know, I'm, being, I'm playing hockey for Brandon. And they got me out of the Army temporarily, and I loved it because I, didn't, I wasn't fond of the Army. I don't like being told what to do. And if you want to piss me off, you tell me how you think, how I'm supposed to think, that I'm really going to be pissed off. Tony managed to follow orders for one day short of a year, working mainly as an orderly. After the war ended, he continued to play hockey with the Brandon Elks, a team known today as the Wheat Kings. By 1948, Tony had shifted his focus to baseball and was recruited for a season as a second baseman with the minor league Brandon Grays, a powerhouse with players who would go on to the major leagues. In 2001, Tony was inducted into the Manitoba Baseball Hall of Fame for his performance during the 1948 season. Although Tony's star was rising and he loved the attention of adoring fans, he began to feel like something was missing. He came to the realization that he wanted to make a name for himself, just not on the back of a jersey. 
There was a friend that used to come to the house whose name was Lloyd Beaton. And he was a commercial artist, and he worked for a large commercial art firm. You have to remember now, this is 1935 or 36. And he used to bring me bits and pieces of paper, broken pencils, and I, I could draw on them. Now, they were terrible, but th at the same time, I know that it was a direction to pursue. And I knew it was, a, it was in the books for me. I had to, had to go on and find out more about it. I'm just, how do they make these big monuments? How do they cast, the, how do they carve out of stone, out of marble? Tony's interest in art became his new passion. He learned from a friend that the Department of Veterans Affairs would sponsor him through university. And so in 1948, he began taking classes at the Winnipeg School of Art. Finally, Tony felt he'd found his niche. By 1949, He'd given up the fickle world of baseball entirely to begin his journey as an artist. It made me think about sports altogether. When you're good, you're in. In art, you don't have to be great. You don't have to be good to be in. You just got to do it. After his graduation from art school in 1953 and subsequent marriage, Tony was left in a difficult position. He wanted to be an artist, but he had to support his family. He began working odd jobs and dedicated nearly every hour of free time to his art. After a year of tedious jobs and restless nights in his studio, the struggling artist met Bjorn Sather. An admirer of Tony's art, Bjorn helped him get a job working as a technician with Canadian Aviation Electronics. In 1957, Tony would go on to work with Air Canada. It was a career choice that would not only support his family and his art, but would also influence and inspire his entire creative process. Working for Air Canada was a boon for me, because I learned a lot about materials, about metals, about shapes and forms. And it just opened a whole new world for me. I got to be an authority on different materials for different products. That's why I was able to do, that's why I'm able to do what I do today. In 1962, Air Canada offered Tony a job in Montreal, a city that was, at the time, considered the artistic centre of Canada. It was kismet, and Tony knew it. He moved his family to Montreal and became immersed in a community unlike any he'd seen before. The art world is, is a bigger and better world in Montreal than you'll ever find out here. I ran into artists like Guido Molinari, Serge Toussaint, uh, Herta Bees, uh, a lot of artists who uh, were well known in Canada and better known, of course, in Quebec. And uh, they worked with various concepts and various materials, and uh, I, I liked what I saw, and they allowed me in. If you reflect on his period in Montreal, for example, where he found a strong affinity with the Montreal artists, the plasticiens, who were reinventing uh, the modern language with geometric abstraction, and he was very close to these artists and really uh, participated in, in what was going on at the time. Tony's involvement in the Montreal art scene led to a major turning point in his artistic style and presence. His work began showing in Toronto, Montreal, and even at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. Although Tony loved the culture, the move was hard on his family. After only two years away, he decided to return to Winnipeg. By 1970, it was easy to see that Tony was one of Manitoba's hottest artists. Sales were booming, and Tony started receiving high-profile public and private commissions. He decided to leave Air Canada and focus entirely on his art. By 74, it was clear that Tascona was a kind of major player here. He was like, I mean, the joke at that time was he was the godfather of Winnipeg art. Uh, I mean, after all, he's, what, Italian, Sicilian, 
Um, he was a, a, a he, he had a lot of control at the time, and I mean that in a very positive way. He was highly respected because he was an artist who never joined the university. He always kind of did it on his own. So he was like this kind of slightly smaller Frank Sinatra of the art world who was doing it his own way at the time. So pretty easy to become aware of Tony in the early 70s. There was always something about Tony that was very much in, in my mind, a kind of romance about being an artist. You know, here he was in Winnipeg with his own studio, doing his own work, doing the work his way, uh, selling it, not necessarily getting closely attached to, to dealers at the time, really sort of doing it on his own. That's a real romance and a very difficult thing to do. And I think that one of the, Tony's great achievements has been that all these years, he's both maintained and sustained a serious career as an artist and basically doing it without a lot of help from anyone else. I mean, he really has been a one-man band and, and that's an admirable thing to do and not an easy one to do in this town. Winnipeg is a very tough town to sell art in and he's been very good at it. He has a sense of the importance of material that, it, that any vision, any production that an artist wants to make it needs to be based on a certain uh, physical fact, you know, color and, and structure, and, and he, he, he demonstrates an affinity for uh, the, the modern uh, media that is quite wonderful. The use of all kinds of materials has been very much a part of contemporary art for a long time, and Tony was in that. Where he's different is he refines the materials. I mean, he uses materials that could be ugly, but Tony never made an ugly piece. He wasn't interested in making things that weren't attractive. He was always interested in the smoother surface, in the way in which you'd get transparencies and layers of color that you could look through. So that in fact, looking at the piece was like looking in a kind of a world that kept going back and back and back. There's lots of ways in which the work demands a kind of almost philosophical response when you look at it. I mean, you look at it and you think about time and space. And as soon as you think about time and space, you're entering the terrain of the spiritual. And there's a way in which Tony's art is always hinting at that sp sense of spiritual entry and entrance ways. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that's extremely attractive for people about them. Also, they just look pretty. They're, you know, they're lovely things to look at. A lot of the times, Tony's surfaces were like looking at the designs out of, out of car manufacturing. I mean, you know, you, you look at a, the surface of a Ferrari and you look at the surface of a Tascona, and they got a lot in common. Throughout the 1960s, he developed an affinity for the materials he encountered at Air Canada. He began experimenting with ways of controlling and layering lacquer paint, and started using aluminum as a canvas. This combination of industrial materials became a signature of his work throughout his career. In 1963, Tony received his first major commission, the Manitoba Centennial Concert Hall. It was a considerable undertaking. He combined multiple layers of hand-shaped aluminum with his signature painting technique creating two 10 by 16 foot pieces, weighing almost 3,000 pounds. These were the first of what Tony would call his aluminum constructions. I'd always worked with aluminum, so I knew all about aluminum. And uh, it seemed like the natural way for me to go. There was a definite reaction among some people telling me that it won't last, it won't adhere, but I proved them all wrong. Never one to back down from a challenge, Tony delved into meticulous research and experimentation with new industrial materials. Throughout the late 60s and early 70s, Tony began experimenting with epoxy resin a material he was first introduced to while working at Air Canada. Resin would become his material of choice for many of his architectural commissions. The resin pieces never really became a reality until 1970 when I got that big commission for the Freshwater Institute at the University of Manitoba. And that was a national competition. Following the Freshwater Institute Commission, Tony would create other stunning resin works, 
including those at the Manitoba Law Courts in 1972 and the St. Boniface Hospital Research Centre in 1986. I would say working with the materials that I worked with was deleterious to my health. I would say that um, working with lacquer and the thinners, sometimes I'd wear a mask and sometimes I wouldn't. That is all not good for your health. And um, I was killing myself. And I was under a lot of stress. Tony began to work less with toxic materials, opting instead to experiment with media he'd rarely used since art school, including acrylic paint and canvas. Even though Tony made efforts to move towards safer media, by the mid-1990s, he began to develop serious back pain and numbness in his legs. 1996, I had what they call spinal stenosis. I really thought that I wouldn't walk again. So I started drawing, and I liked the feel of it. And you have to tell yourself, you know, the hell with it. If I can't do a big painting, I'll do something small. Tony underwent surgery for his spinal stenosis. During his recovery, he turned to drawing a creative process he found less physically demanding. Since he started having back trouble, uh, sort of had to reprogram some things. And uh, I think he started to reduce um, and refocus himself in some ways. And he's tapping into some energies that have always been there, but they've been expressed in different ways. After Tony recovered from back surgery, he returned to painting. But he continued to experience pain and discomfort in his back and began to focus more of his creative energy on drawing. At the age of 75, shortly after opening his 2001 Winnipeg Art Gallery show, Resonance, Tony's health faltered again. At the advice of his doctors, he underwent heart surgery. In the years that followed, Tony continued to work with other media, but found that drawing allowed him a new form of creative expression. Tony's gone from a time when his work was very, um, I, I wouldn't say rigid, but linear and structured. And now it's becoming so lifelike and um, spiritual. And um, there's some fun in it uh, that that wasn't there. So, but you can see where Tony is in his life by the work that he's doing. It changes, and depending, just as we change from time to time, his work changes. What is striking Tony's work is the clarity of his line. He does not hesitate. There's a certain exuberance in the form and, and it's, uh, I can only describe it as energy. They're, they're, they have very beautiful energy and they're very lively drawings. Uh, there's a sense of, uh, you almost see his brain, the electricity in the brain working, you know, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful. I think that's uh, very attractive and very original, really. I think that Tony almost reinvented himself in the last 10 years or so when he began to do those new drawings, which were, in some ways you can see now, they, they bear a strong relationship to his earlier work, but they're also very different at the same time. And I love those drawings. I think they're a major step forward for Tony, and that's a hell of a thing to do when you're, you know, in your 70s, you suddenly decide to, that you're going to reinvent yourself as an artist. Keep yourself both interested in what you're doing and keep an audience interested in what it is you're making is a hell of a difficult thing to do, and Tony's done it like nobody in, this, in the city. Tony Tascona touched the lives of countless people through his art and his soul. He was notoriously generous, donating thousands of dollars in artwork to various charities each year. 
Among his numerous accolades, he received an honorary doctorate of law from the University of Winnipeg in 1994. Two years later, his significant presence in the Canadian art community, both creatively and philanthropically, earned him a membership in the Order of Canada. In March 2006, hundreds of people who'd been touched by Tony's spirit gathered to celebrate his 80th birthday in style at an exhibition of his latest work. Who got me the goalkeeper's mask? 30 of his most intimate spiritual drawings graced the walls of the Franco-Manitoban Cultural Centre for a show titled Transformation. The 80th birthday celebrations continued for nearly a month, including an intimate event thrown by the University of Winnipeg Foundation, which celebrated both Tony's birthday and the ninth annual presentation of the Tony Tascona Bursary. It is his legacy to the University of Winnipeg. It is the Tony Tascona Bursary. I decided to set up this bursary at the University of Winnipeg. And I think you should leave something in a legacy. You should leave something behind. I don't know one other artist in this country, in Canada, who has created a fund like that and um, to help the younger artists become part of the broad artistic community and, and express themselves in, in, in a better way than they would have if they did not get these grants. No, I take pride in it. I, I think it's a wonderful thing. I set it up because I was tired of it listen to the people saying, well, who is that artist? And if you ask artists who this, these artists are in Canada, they wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. I ask you to join me. In it's remarkable. Work. It shows his commitment to the community. It shows his kind of realistic understanding that if you want a community to flourish in the arts, you need to help younger artists. The Tony Tascona Bursary was established in 1997 and continues to help young students who demonstrate an interest in Canadian art history. The bursary has helped me to develop as an artist, mostly because I know that there is support available out there. My dream suddenly doesn't seem so vague. It's, I, there's help out there and there's people that are excited about it and there's people that have been spending their lives making art like Tony Tascona who's willing to support a younger generation of artists. The bursary is just one of many ways Tony has created a legacy in his name. Tony's true legacy lies in the way he touched the lives of others. I really feel that knowing Tony has been one of the bright spots of my life, and it's been an honor and a pleasure to know him. I always thought of Tony as a kind of gentleman in a way. I mean, this sort of Italian gentleman who really believed in being an artist. He must have been a terrific hockey player or a terrific baseball player. He probably could hit the puck and the, or the baseball with a lot of precision and a lot of energy because it's in his art. I never thought I'd ever make it to 80. I mean, that's, that's a hell of a long, that's a long road to hoe. Two and a half months after reaching his 80th birthday, Tony Tascona passed away from heart failure on May 28, 2006. Tony began painting this piece only weeks before his death. It remains forever untitled and unfinished and is the last piece he would ever work on. <laughs>